Good evening and welcome to the discussion on arbitration and FDI being organized as a part of the India Law Forum and LitFest under the track on law and ease of doing business under the aegis of the 82nd Scotch Summit being held by Scotch Group this year, 2022. India's decision to not sign the RCEP was predicated on MFN forward obligations and ratchet clauses that many, including Scotch Group, vehemently believed would serve as a backdoor for China's entry into Indian markets. Subsequently, the Standing Committee of External Affairs, chaired by Mr. P. P. Chaudhary, submitted a report on the subject, India and Bilateral Investment Treaties, on the 10th of September 2021. The committee noted that up until 2015, India had signed BITs with 83 countries, of which 74 were in force. India revised its model BIT text in 2015, and the committee observed that since then, India has signed new BITs with only four countries and is negotiating with 37 countries and blocks. It also noted that India has terminated its older BITs with 77 countries. The committee observed that the number of BITs signed by India after 2015 and the number under negotiation are inadequate. It noted that BITs have the potential to attract foreign direct investment by providing prospective investors with a higher degree of confidence in their investments. In this light, the committee recommended signing new BITs with countries with which India has had such treaties in the past and signing BITs selectively in identified priority sectors, as well as the early completion of treaty negotiations. Interestingly, the committee also noted that so far, there have been 37 notices of dispute or letters intending to raise a dispute against India under various BITs. Our panel of experts this evening discusses all this and more. Our first speaker in the conference on arbitration and FTI is Professor Bimal Patel, member designate International Law Commission and Vice Chancellor of the Rashtriya Raksha University. Professor Dr. Bimal N. Patel is currently the Vice Chancellor of the Rashtriya Raksha First Police and Internal Security University of India and a member of the National Security Advisory Board of India. Professor Patel has also recently been elected as a member of the UN International Law Commission. Professor Patel is a former international civil servant, scholar and academician of international law and diplomacy. As an international jurist, Professor Patel has extensively studied, researched and commented on published and published works on the administrative, procedural and substantive jurisprudence of the International Court of Justice and various other international forums. Professor Patel has also been instrumental in drafting several legislations in India and holds numerous global academic appointments. Professor Makan Mois Mbenge, Professor International Law Faculty of the Faculty of Law at the University of Geneva, also serves as the director of the Department of International Law and the International Organization. He is also an affiliate professor at Sciences Po Paris, since 2017, he is the president of the African Society of International Law. He was the lead expert for the negotiations and drafting of the Pan-African Investment Code in the context of the African Union. He has acted and acts as an expert for the African Union, the Secretary General of the United Nations, the UNEP, the WHO, the World Bank, the ILO, and the Organization of the Islamic Conference, as well as the International Institute for Sustainable Development against others. He also acts as counsel in disputes before international courts and tribunals, in particular before the International Court of Justice and in investment cases and serves as an advisor for governments. He is involved in the negotiations of several international investment agreements in Africa. Mr. Vyapak Desai, head international disputes resolutions at Nishit Desai Associates, also heads the investigation practice at this multi-skill research and strategy-driven law firm, Nishit Desai Associates. He's a senior attorney with the firm. Mr. Vyapak Desai specializes in bringing in the highest level of analytical and innovative input in cross-border complex, contentious matters and corporate regulatory investigations. He has also led the corporate and securities practice of the firm in the past. We're delighted to have Ms. Naomi Brycliffe, Counsel, Alina Nobri, United Kingdom with us. Ms. Naomi Brycliffe represents clients in international and commercial investor state arbitrations and has also advised on state-to-state -state disputes, including those before the International Court of Justice and the Iran-US Claims Tribunal. She has experience of institutional and ad hoc arbitration proceedings, including arbitrations under the ICC, the LCIA, the SCC, the ICSID, and UN Citral rules. She has appeared as counsel and advocate in commercial investor state and state-to-state -state cases. 
Mr. Manish Sansi is Chief Legal Officer at Vodafone Idea Limited. He was previously DGM Legal Secretarial at Indus Towers Limited and Vice President Legal and Secretarial at Telenor. He has also served as the General Counsel for India and Company Secretary as well as Deputy Chief Compliance Officer for Tata Communications. He's an experienced in-house legal professional with more than 25 years of experience with leadership roles in legal functions. Our moderator for today is Anirudh Lekhi, an international dispute resolution attorney. Anirudh is an India qualified lawyer with an interest in international commercial arbitration, international investment arbitration, and public international law. Prior to joining the MIDS, Anirudh worked at Shardul Amarchal Mangaldas, New Delhi, where he was an integral part of its international arbitration and litigation team for upwards of three years. At Amarchand, he represented clients in international arbitrations under various institutional rules, post award actions, and also worked on complex shareholder disputes, regulatory actions, and post merger litigations. Additionally, Anirudh holds an LLM from Columbia Law School, where he graduated with academic distinction as a Harlan Fisk Stone Scholar and obtained the Parker School Certificate for Proficiency in Foreign and Comparative Law. He's also served as the editor of the American Review of the International Arbitration and was a research assistant to Professor George Berman at Columbia. Over to you, Anirudh. Thank you so much for the introduction, Rohan, and thank you to the very distinguished panel that is uh, joining us here today from various different parts of the world and various different time zones. A uh, very warm welcome to all our viewers who are here to listen to these extremely illustrious individuals. Uh, to give a context to the current debate and the current uh, discussion, India is pegged to receive as much as $100 billion in foreign direct investment in 2022 alone. And it is likely to become a $5 trillion economy in the next five years. Therefore, with the ever-increasing FDI, it is also poised to become a hotbed of international dispute resolution, in particular international arbitration. Therefore, and in this regard, a responsible and efficient legal machinery that offers a forum to an investor to ventilate its concerns is considered extremely imperative. And one way of conferring these investment protections is, as we all know, through bilateral investment treaties, which offer a very novel method of dispute resolution that is directly between an investor and the state. However, and of late, uh, the ISDS setup has come under scrutiny with its potentially crippling awards that may have you know, drastic consequences on different economies. And this, to a large extent, has been attributed to vague and undefined standards that may have been found inside these bilateral investment treaties. Today's panel has assembled to address the merits and demerits of the system and explore its linkages with foreign direct investment. And therefore, the first part of today's discussion will open the floor to our panelists who will make certain preliminary remarks on today's subject of discussion. We will then proceed to explore the architecture of these bilateral investment treaties and the potential ways in which their physiology can affect foreign direct investment. And finally, this panel will discuss the current trends in ISDS and their impact on investor confidence. But without any further ado, I would direct my first question to Professor Makan. Uh, Professor, for a very long time, many of the capital exporting states have been advocates of maintaining the current ISDS system. And you have, in fact, been a very vocal critic of the so-called global north that understands the drastic consequences of ISDS and sells the promise of greater investment through these bilateral investment treaties. So do you find any merit in the argument that greater FDI will come after signing bilateral investment treaties? And further, given that there is certain information asymmetry before a state goes on to sign these bilateral investment treaties, how have you responded in the course of your negotiations with respect to various governments? Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Anirudh. And thank you again very much to the organizers for, for the invitation. I, uh, it's a great pleasure to, to be on this panel with such uh, distinguished uh, colleagues and, uh, and, and, and experts. And of course, I would like to, to congratulate 
uh, again, Professor Bimal Patel for, for his election at the International Law um, Commission. You, you, you know, uh, Anirud, if I can just go straight to the, to the point uh, with respect to your, to your main question uh, regarding, uh, regarding whether uh, bilateral investment treaties uh, can really increase um, investment flows on the territory of, of, of a state. You know, let me just say uh, straight away that no, no, there is, there is no uh, evidence that concluding bilateral investment treaties would actually uh, contribute or would actually increase uh, investment flows on the territory of a, of a country. You know, I've been working for many countries uh, in Africa reviewing uh, their bilateral investment uh, treaties uh, policies. And, and it's very surprising to see that in many countries, when you check who are, who are, who are um, the, 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 the countries from which most of the investors would come from, you would see that quite often uh, the host country at stake doesn't have any BIT, any concluded bilateral investment treaty with the country or the countries for, from which most of the investors are, are, are coming from. And I could give uh, many examples. You, what would attract uh, FDI on the territory of a state is a favorable investment climate. Investors, they go where they know that there would be a favorable investment uh, climate. And bilateral uh, investment treaties they have not focused on building a favorable investment climate. If you look at the traditional model of, of, of BITS, the focus has been only on, 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 on investment protection. So what is very important when it comes to FDI is actually investment promotion and investment facilitation. This is how you build a favorable investment climate in a country by, by promoting investment and particular investment facilitation is, is very fundamental. And, and if you look at the traditional architecture or design of, of bits, what you will see is that, you know, promotion is not there, facilitation is not there. Yes, yes, many of those bilateral investment treaties would be entitled uh, agreements on the promotion and protection of, 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 of investment between two nations. But the idea of promotion you know, stays or is just limited in the title of, of the agreement. No mechanisms, no devices are, 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 are truly put in place to actually ensure that the bilateral investment treaty would be a tool for investment promotion. No mechanisms, no devices are put in place in a, to, to ensure that the bid would be also an instrument of investment uh, facilitation. So this is uh, what we really need, if we really want bilateral investment treaties to attract FDI, to be real instruments for investment attraction, then you need to, 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 to make sure that mechanisms, provisions, devices um, are, are incorporated in relation to investment promotion and investment facilitation. And this is why if you look at the most recent generation of, 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 of investment agreements, they, they, they do no longer focus at least exclusively on investment protection. Uh, in, in Africa, we are right now negotiating a future investment protocol uh, to the African continental free trade area. And the focus is on investment promotion and investment facilitation. So it doesn't mean that there won't be any protection, but you have several provisions insisting on investment promotion and on investment facilitation. If you take the Brazilian model, Brazil has always isolated itself from the traditional dominant model of, 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 of bits. And what, what Brazil has come up with is an alternative that is actually focusing on investment facilitation and investment cooperation. Investment cooperation is also fundamental. It's, it's one aspect of investment promotion. Investment cooperation is also fundamental for for, for really attracting FDI on the territory of the state. You know, the traditional model of, of bits, they don't lead to any cooperation. 
the day India has concluded a bilateral investment treaty with a with a third state, it's the last time that India hears about that that BIT. There's no cooperation at all that would actually put in place a process that would allow the two countries to cooperate and to foster uh, FDI flows on, on, on their territories. So this is another vacuum, another, another element that is absent from, from BITS, this aspect of, 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 of cooperation. And one other aspect that has made BITS quite insufficient or quite, um, I would say, useless in attracting FDI is that bilateral investment treaties, they do not uh, take into account what we call the investment life cycle. You know, the investment life cycle is based on five main phases. You would have what we call a vision or strategy for FDI. That's the first element of the investment life cycle. Then the second element um, would be a policy of attraction of FDI. That's the second element of, of, of the the second phase or second element of the investment life cycle. Then the third element of the investment life cycle would be, you know, policies for estab- establishment, policies, regulation for the establishment of, of, of FDI on a territory. And the fourth, fourth aspect of investment life cycle is investment protection. So standards that would allow to protect. Bits, they've been only focusing on that fourth aspect of the investment life cycle, which is protection. But you have a fifth very important aspect of the investment life cycle, which is investment retention and expansion. Investment retention and expansion. So meaning, once the investment is on your territory, how do you make sure that you retain it? And how do you make sure that it would expand? Attracting investment without retaining it, without ensuring expansion, is useless. And bits. The problem with BITS is that they kind of nullify investment retention and expansion, you know, because of what? Because of ISDS. Because of ISDS. You were asking me what is, in my view, the main problem, the main drawback drawback with ISDS. The main problem is that ISDS is not focusing on dispute prevention. ISDS is very confrontational, in particular, the investment arbitration, the investor state arbitration aspect of ISDS is very confrontational. It puts the investor and the host state always in a confrontational uh, relation. But if you want really to retain investment, to expand investment, you need to think about investment dispute prevention. Make sure that when investors have difficulties on the territory of a state, that they would have access to grievance mechanisms, that they would have access to alert mechanisms, that they would have access to aftercare mechanisms that would actually allow them to alleviate, to de-escalate their dispute with the, with the host states. And this is how you build a win-win relationship. So ISDS itself, which is the core element, the core provision of, of, of bits, is, 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 is not the right tool for investment retention and expansion because it is confrontational. Once you have a dispute between an investor and a state, it destroys the investment relationship because an investor that, that pursues a state, that sues a state and asking that state to pay $1 billion, I don't know how many billion dollars, will of course not stay in that country. And this is also very damageable to the, to the reputation, to the image of, 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 of the country that is being sued. So, so this mechanism, which is ISDS, which is at the earth of BIT itself, is counterproductive to really ensure, you know, FDI attraction and FDI retention and expansion in developing countries. Thank you so much for those very, very candid remarks, uh, Professor Makana. And I'm sure you will find many allies in India who will uh, echo those remarks. And uh, I am just reminded of a statement that was made by one of the Brazilian investment negotiators and I during the course of my preparation uh, for this summit. And I thought it'll, in light of your remarks, it'll be very interesting to quote his remarks in the backdrop of what you said. And uh, our Brazilian negotiator said, and I quote, 
um, investment treaties are much like prenuptial agreements where a couple agrees to get married but is already looking ahead to the terms on which a divorce might happen after that divorce each party goes its separate way and is not to be seen again i prefer to think that brazil's investment facilitation approach as more akin to a couples counseling because we are trying to facilitate a long term relationship that remains positive rather than envisages a future divorce it's a completely different approach unquote and therefore this is one view that is now gaining a very wide groundswell across the world especially uh, india and in that light i thought it will only be appropriate to get another very very distinguished scholar from india to weigh in on this issue issue uh, professor bimal patel uh, firstly many many congratulations on your election uh, to the ilc and uh, it was a very proud moment for all of us indians for you to win in such a resounding fashion uh, my question to you is that the job of the ilc is primarily to codify customary international law and uh, the articles on state responsibility have provided a very good scaffolding for a lot of uh, jurisprudence around investor state dispute resolution in this regard how do you view the role of international law in creating an environment that facilitates investment and trade thank you very much prelude uh, first of all thank you for the invitation and uh, thank you professor makane for your congratulatory remarks uh, we are meeting after 10 years since we met in jnlu uh, due to short notice and uh, hectic agenda my remarks are perhaps in coit and my apology for the same but i will be focusing on what the law and obligation regime is instead of what it ought to be so the risks associated with the continuous wave of pandemic the pace of development deployment of immunization programs economic support for measures the continuous fragility of macroeconomic situations in key emerging markets the deferred situations arising in few developing countries in pretty sri lanka and the uncertainty for the global policy environment for investment will all continue to affect fdi flows therefore one has to creatively and innovatively think of role of international law and international obligations because such situation has arisen more than after a century in 20th century there was no global international law it was international law meant for few western and later american countries africa asia and uh, pacific island states were yet to be decolonized and to become part of international economic landscapes the pandemic health crisis has helped to increase the use of screening mechanisms to oppose sometimes publicly transactions involving the sale of companies considered to be strategic if you see the new political and economic nationalism has emerged which is contradictory to global common sense world international law prior to pandemic will be unable to take care therefore a lot of rules and norms for international obligations have to be rewritten or practiced afresh we all welcome fdi for employment but also for its positive spillover effects on political diplomacy in commercial relations however the new economic nationalism will give stiff resistance to fdi one will see in my view a lot of short term bargaining at bilateral multilateral level to fix short term solutions in other words short termism of international obligation will arise as far as india is concerned one can expect bright short to mid term future as technology and health sector will see strong boom there will be rush for fdi to india in these two sectors because india enjoys age and therefore you will see significant transaction activity and in the sectors and more mergers and acquisitions are likely to occur however as a current investor was unprepared for such eventuality india or countries in similar situation will rely on bilateral mechanisms instead of international treaty framework on a flip side india has to be careful because there will be lot of predatory takeovers 
which will be skillfully enforced and orchestrated by countries supporting predatory takeovers. On a positive side, new sectors focused upon by India strongly such as infrastructure, maritime, aviation, even sports, will come under stress from the same predatory takeover supporting states having technology how to how experience and funds as they will seek strong bargain for India. Private sectors will exercise tremendous pressure on sovereign structures for their survival and growth and countries starved of foreign reserves or lack of domestic capital will be under pressure from these sectors to seek quick and cheap foreign funding all at cost to quick fix international obligations. It may be therefore possible that several countries may become that tripped soon by the predatory states 10 years from, the, from now. Allow me to contextualize about analysis in case of top FDI investors in India. Singapore, Mauritius, Cayman Islands, UK, Germany, US, UAE and Netherlands, Japan and Cyprus. Together, they will invest about 59.6 billion US dollar in 2021. The top 10 sectors are computer software, construction services, trading, automobile, drugs, pharma, metallurgy, chemical, and telecom. Thus, the focus shall be how these 10 countries and India see international law and obligations in these areas. I will give you examples from only two countries, Netherlands and Germany. Since Netherlands is one of the most open liberal capitalist countries, private international, that is government to business and business to business, occupies the center of focus. The obligations are generated through bilateral contracts instead of treaty framework. How Netherlands, a small advanced rich country, has been able to remain one of the top five FDIs for years without any formal dispute with India. Over more than 200 Dutch companies are there in India. And as I said, obligations are largely based on contracts than treaty law. Indian companies too are making major acquisitions in Netherlands. Indian companies, like in the United Kingdom, are a good source of employment creation in Netherlands as well, as these are also more export intensive than the domestic firms. But, and that's catch, in 2019, Due to COVID and increasingly protective foreign investment measures globally, the Dutch government recognized that the shift in the financial economic world order was one of the 11 dominant threats to the Dutch national security. In June 21, less than a year back, the government announced the introduction of a broader national security investment screening policy covering investments in vital infrastructure and sensitive technologies. I believe that establishment of the investment screen office in Netherlands to advise on jurisdictional and substantive questions which can also be consulted by market participants is a significant development which brings political concerns into business interest, whether we like or otherwise. These will have certain implications on bilateral relations and government will try to find legal justification to protect and promote its interest. In March 2019, you might be doing, the European Council adopted the EU Foreign Directive Investment Regulations. And this particular regulation provides for an enabling framework for member states to review FDI on grounds of security and public policy and to increase cooperation as a matter of priority between the member states. Thus, India's trade and investment relations with Netherlands will be subject to the EU policy in general, but Netherlands being a liberal nation among others will still have its nationalist approach to the investment and trade. In October 2020, the Dutch government enacted the telecommunications investment screening regime. The government significantly amended the draft act since telecom is an important area of collaboration, incoming and outgoing flow of investment will be subjected to this additional layer of scrutiny, which was absent earlier. Notifications made under the telecommunications, energy, and national security regimes are subjected to far more strict reviews. Now, prior to 2019, this was completely a liberal open market. 
but these changes have taken place whether how these changes will affect the already existing contracts or bilateral economic trade and investment relations is a big inquiry if you look at the latest dutch telecommunication act electricity act and the gas act these prescribe prohibitions on the privatization of electricity and gas transmission systems operators private investment investors cannot acquire such companies and very importantly the national security regime will apply with retrospective effect although we do not expect that it will be used but the retroactive effect of the fdi screening rule will lead to uncertainty for business and investors and in this sense i'm particularly interested in learning how mr sansi who is with us today uh, from vodafone because this case created a huge controversy on this very important aspect of retroactive, retroactive effect does this analysis makes it clear that liberal international law will meet resistance for trade and investment facilitation as far as netherlands is concerned my remarks on german is quite similar german policy on foreign investment has also become restrictive due to not only geopolitical competition with china but germany's need and germany's appeal to restore what it call technological sovereignty the military goods the critical infrastructure and critical industries all are made subject to this particular scrutiny these are also the areas where india is in need for funding and technology investment it is an interesting note that acquisitions by germany purchases may also be reviewed by german ministry if the ultimate economic beneficiary is a foreign investor in other words outgoing investment from india to germany in certain sectors now are more restricted now what it says now what are the warning sign posts for india the western drive and the rise of economic nationalism will have serious implications for internationalization in knowledge intensive services where india enjoys age let's look at professional services such as consulting and other soft services which involve considerable face to face interaction this requires the movement of people across border but if you see the state practice of the developed world netherlands germany usa the visa requirements have significantly affected indian service industry similarly the international provision of many services like for example medical care even design industry also involves navigating registration requirements which are now subjected to rapid change brought into domestic laws of these eu countries service related business in industries that can be viewed as economic critical for example mining oil and gas or with substantial security implications telecommunication are going to find themselves subject to increased fluctuation concerning regulatory environments challenging business managers abilities to undertake even relatively i'm telling relatively short term strategizing it is therefore what i expect that there will be rising differences and disputes of commercial and industrial nature and in this sense i was quite happy to see where professor makane was talking because when i was looking at the ixid rules which is coming into force from 1st of july ixid rules india is not a party to ixid it does provide certain relief and i believe uh, india would be looking at how this ixid rules 2022 uh, will play out into effect and how this the whole regime of uh, international law and obligations uh, will change in the years to come thank you thank you so much uh, professor patel uh, i think the time is now ripe to get some views from our practitioners who are on the panel today as well and uh, in this regard uh, I, i would just like to say that you know the isds re regime generally involves uh, some kind of jostling between the government that wants to regulate as well as the investor who wants to seek investment protections uh in this regard if we look at you know certain instances or cases such as you know occidental versus ecuador we've seen that the isds regime has been termed in many ways as being biased in favor of corporate interests 
Ecuador had to face a 2.3 billion dollar award, which at that time was the highest quantum of award ever rendered uh, by the ICSID. And very significantly, this constituted 135 percent of Ecuador's budget for healthcare that year. Uh, and this has led to a certain kind of uh, dubious overture towards uh, bilateral investment treaties. So, in this regard, my question would be addressed to uh, Mr. Desai. Uh, similarly, the white industries case had opened up India to the realities of multi-billion-dollar awards, and India's response to the white industries case was the model bilateral investment treaty of 2016, which was termed as more conservative than it ought to be by certain commentators. My question is that. in the light of these kinds of conservative standards that may be enshrined in bilateral investment treaties how much will this affect the perception of india as a viable destination of foreign direct investment sure thanks a lot everyone uh, thanks scotch group and india law forum for organizing this and thanks anirudh for getting this uh, you know um, panel uh, to this level but uh, so my sense uh, we have uh, heard a lot on the world view right how things are moving uh, depending upon external and internal factors i think when it comes to india we had a very different journey uh, and as always india has always a unique experience to everything uh, i think uh, if we just take a little a step uh, back uh, in the history uh we started our journey on bits in the early 90s uh and by the time uh of 2012 which is i think you refer to the white industries case we almost had more than 75 or 77 bits by then and maybe few others came um uh, a little more than that uh later uh but we never had a single case except the enron saga uh which happened in the early 2000 and that was even settled at that point in time so almost for 20 years while we had uh more than 75 bits uh we never had a single case against india uh, till then uh and if you see even white industries it has come from a very unique situation uh which is a commercial arbitration uh which you know the award was uh pending for enforcement for more than you know 7 8 uh, 10 years and that was the reason why you know white industries uh bit happened and uh, india responded in two ways right it was a small award comparatively uh and luckily india uh, didn't challenge it paid off the amount uh, uh so that was in my view a good a uh, way to you know confirm that we uh, we are not here just to have the treaties and not adhere to it uh, on the other hand uh, it definitely in 2012 had huge impact uh, on the fdi uh, you know investment regime uh, so far as india is concerned i think the uh, brand india at that time uh, definitely took a beating uh, in fact along with that i think the retrospective aspects came along and in no time in less than 10 years we have more than 20 bit claims right so 20 years went by without a bit claim and then we had like you know more than 20 cases in less than a decade uh, so i think we had a very different uh, regime but i would say uh, the way i perceive and the way i saw things moving i think 2012 to 2015 because so much was happening in terms of uh the investment protection and how india was reacting to things uh the way vodafone uh saga happened where you know the new law was brought in just after the supreme court decision uh you know striking off uh the uh, the notices issued against them under the taxation law i think i would say and and uh, we as a law firm uh, look at the investment side as well and we definitely saw uh that there was a huge impact uh between 2012 and 2015 maybe the numbers or statistics will also show uh some kind of a uh, deep or at least not the kind of growth expected at that point in time but on the other hand uh, uh you know while uh 
professor patel uh, you know refer to 10 countries and the kind of investments coming from those 10 countries uh, but interestingly in spite of you know more than 75 bits one country where we never had a bit was uh, us and while it doesn't reflect in the fdi uh, uh, you know uh, data but directly indirectly in my view us is still one of the most significant trade partner for india a lot of investment coming through interim or interjecting jurisdictions uh, originate from us or us related investments and we never had uh, any bit there now whether they use interjecting jurisdictions uh, for tax purpose for bit purpose or for multiple purposes it's a different discussions altogether but in spite of the fact that we had a very good relationships with them we never had a bit so question always comes up in in the context of india as to whether uh, bits do affect uh, the fdi uh, did uh, white industry made a huge impact uh, and whether you know uh, the new regime which came after 2015 which was much more conservative regime and we didn't extend the existing bits as you i think uh, uh, as rohan mentioned earlier several of them uh, have been terminated or have not been extended uh, from the earlier regime and now only four or five are under consideration and uh, or already signed and um, more than 30 are under consideration that shows that india is going very very slow in signing those bits uh, on the other hand india is still the top 10 destinations of bits i'm just giving you two different views uh, just to bring the context that uh, you know one would never know this impact now can i say that if we would have a very liberal bits we would have two times five times the investments i don't know because unless we have it uh, nobody can vouch it right uh, whether we are getting less because of non having the bits uh, our experience from a us perspective i don't think it has a direct correlation uh so strong but yes if we don't have uh the 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 focus and the regime uh, as uh, even uh, uh you know the uh, earlier we heard about the promotion and investment and protection goes hand in hand uh, i think india will never get the kind of attention which it ought to uh, maybe it will still be top 10 of the fdi investment uh but it is it is losing out on the potential uh, uh rather than uh you know uh, saying that look our fundamentals are so strong uh and having that arrogance or otherwise uh maybe we'll still continue to have fdi because maybe there is less choice uh beyond this 10 top 10 destinations uh and we have very strong fundamentals in terms of uh, our geography our diversity Uh, the kind of uh, uh, mix of uh, young youth uh, and the uh, you know uh, the economy which is self consuming in that sense we don't need to look outside for consumption uh, i think we'll continue to have the uh, the the investment but to say uh, that it doesn't have an effect uh, i i don't think uh, that is correct i i don't think we will ever get uh, the right data but we'll definitely not get the potential uh the growth potential if we don't have both the promotion and protection in place uh, so far as uh, the world order is concerned uh now obviously we can discuss the uh, current set of new bits post 2016 more importantly interestingly india brazil maybe little later uh, but my initial thoughts are that while history says that it may not be directly proportionate but in my view we are not uh, you know getting our potential growth uh, because of not having the right promotion and protection regime uh, from an uh, you know investment uh, perspective so that's broadly how i see the effect of white industries uh, so, in fact sorry to uh, you know i i just remind i just uh, remembered in 2011 even before white industries came up Uh, i was in the harvard university in boston talking about bits and people said why an indian lawyer or uh, you know 
uh, Indian firm is even talking about BITs because we had no experience other than Enron. But we saw that coming. Uh, we we thought that this is something that we are not giving enough focus. And then white industry came, and then everyone was talking about BITs. Uh, and till 2015, definitely it was not a, a great uh, time. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Desai. So we already have a very interesting cleavage of opinion that has developed uh, in this panel. While Professor Makan is very blunt and he is of the opinion that there is absolutely no relationship between foreign direct investment and uh, greater FDI, Mr. Desai seems to believe that uh, by not signing FDIs, you are still foregoing on the potential of foreign direct investment. And indeed, India's uh, image did take uh, uh, an impact, uh, was impacted actually, after the white industries case. Um, my question would now be addressed to Ms. Briarcliff. In your experience, do you think investors look at destinations with greater uh, protections differently? And what alternatives do they have should they want to invest in jurisdictions that do not offer such protections? What has your experience been? Thanks very much, Anirudh. And I echo um, the thanks of the other speakers for having me on, on this panel today. Um, I think I'm going to end up probably somewhere towards the position of Mr. Sai, um, because in my experience, um, the investors that I advise do tend to take the availability of investment treaties into account when making international investments. Um, and provided that a treaty provides adequate protections, including, and I'm sort of emphasizing this here in light of uh, India's recent investment treaty um, practice, the availability of investor state arbitration, then um, those treaties are viewed as an important mitigant of political risk um, and therefore a factor that is taken into account um, in whether or not they, they conclude an investment. Now, whether or not the investments uh, would have been made in the absence of um, an, an investment treaty is another question. Um, and, you know, we've heard uh, Professor Mbeng on his views on that. And I, and I tend to agree that broadly a favourable investment climate is going to be the thing which attracts, uh, is the most important for an investor when making an investment. But where investors perceive there to be risk, and I think that there is, um, you know, from some quarters, a perception that in India is a risky investment jurisdiction, largely due, in my view, to um, the, uh, people's perception of, of the uh, Indian court system. And then in those circumstances, investment treaties can help investors um, to get comfortable with uh, investing in, in that environment. Um, so as Mr. Desai says, perhaps India is getting great investment flows, um, but you know, if there were available investment treaties um, with sufficient protections, then there maybe there would be greater uh, in investment flows. Um, now, of course, uh, there are alternatives for investors when um, considering to make investments, how to mitigate political risk. For example, they can enter into investment contracts that contain um, favorable dispute resolution provisions or other clauses which management manage host state risk um, or indeed can undertake um, political risk insurance. Um, but none of those alternatives to mitigate uh, investment risk is of the same scope and benefits as a uh, an investment treaty which contains um, the investment protections that, that investors generally look for. Um, so I think that, you know, my view is that, um, you know, the benefit of investment treaties ten is likely to depend on, on jurisdiction, whether or not an investor cares will depend on um, that and then also the sector they're investing in, whether the investment is going to be made in a project where um, they have direct um, a direct relationship with the host state. And in those circumstances, probably an investor is likely to consider, well, what recourse would they, what, 
what luck would they have in getting recourse against that state if there were to be a problem before the host state's national courts or if they have investment treaties or if they have sorry international commercial arbitration in their contracts will they be able to enforce that award but where they have any doubts about that uh, and in my view and in my experience some investors do have doubts about that um, in the context of investment in India, then an investment treaty, arbit- uh, the possibility of investment treaty arbitration becomes very important. It's very interesting to know that investors do actually look at these in- investment protections uh, before they venture into making that investment in a territory. And uh, it's very refreshing to know that you have also seen investors do that in your practice. But if we look at the current BITs, we will also notice that the architecture of these BITs is also gradually changing. And uh, to give you one example, the the Indian model bilateral investment treaty from 2016 uh, did away with the FET standard completely and also changed the definition of expropriation to eliminate judgments and arbitral awards. Uh, so, whether an investor would then, you know, maybe change its perception about whether it wants to go ahead with an investment or not, uh, will be interesting to see in light of these uh, changing standards in bilateral investment treaties. But specifically with respect to investment contracts, an investor has many forums before which he may have recourse. An investor may have recourse before an arbitral tribunal uh, and uh, he may have recourse before the courts of the national jurisdiction or may also invoke investor state arbitration. Mr. Sansi, in your opinion, in light of broadly worded treaty protections, would you recommend arbitration under a treaty as the best available alternative? And do you believe that such broader and open-ended treaty provisions makes the recourse to treaty arbitration more amenable to an arbitrator, to, to an investor? Mr. Sansi, I believe you're muted. Hello, am I audible now? Yes. Okay, uh, let me start by thanking you all for having me around in the, on this forum, and it's really uh, so enlightening to um, to hear all of you and your views uh, on this. And before I get into the specifics of uh, answering uh, to the point that you raised uh, to me, uh, I would just want to elaborate and, and, and put forth my view uh, <laughs> on the on the on the issue of or on the point of a must-have or good-to-have. Uh, uh, investment treaty and you know I'm going to sail in between the two positions that have been taken thus thus far between what Mr. Makane said and what Mr. Desai just now said. Uh, my view is that uh, <coughs> my view is that investor uh, protection treaties is uh, in the form of say bilateral treaties or whatever. I mean these are not must-haves but are good to have, <laughs> right? Um, and, 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 I, and I can I can explain this with an example. Um, India went ahead and terminated so many of its BITs uh, mid mid uh, 2000 in, in the last decade, right? And that was also the time when India possibly has seen the best FDI inflow, right? Uh, so so it it goes on to say that uh, while the country may not have a robust BIT regime and had rather gone ahead and annulled many of those, but still it was able to attract a lot of foreign investment into the country, and which is which which is just pointing to the fact that it is uh, bilateral investment treaties are not must have. But then, as Naomi just now mentioned, uh, as she deals with a lot of investors and 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 who, who, potential investors. Uh, and they show their interest and and, and curiosity about uh, what is the investment protection regime that the country offers. So uh, from that perspective, I would say it will always be good to have a a sound and a robust uh, bilateral investment uh, treaty regime in the country, which can provide good investor uh, protection. Uh, this is this is what my view is, and therefore I'm going to say, as I said, I'm going to sail between the two positions which which have been taken uh, till now. 
now uh, coming to uh, your question on uh, now what are the uh, sorry what your question was on is is investor protection treaty the best alternate or there are other alternate i think that's what that's what your question query is yes, yes. So, so my question is that when we talk about investment contracts uh yeah. investor are out of the same contract may have different forums to ventilate yeah. uh, its concerns and given the broad based nature of treaty protection uh do you think as an investor the investor would prefer to go before a treaty forum only because of the broad based nature of the protections that are provided in it and therefore and in other words is treaty arbitration the best available alternative for an investor from an investor standpoint well i don't think there will be a one fit suit all type of an answer to this uh, and it will depend on a case to case and an investment to investment and the type of dispute that is there uh, and i would but i would rather say that this uh, is not the only best available uh, dispute resolution alternate uh, there are other international commercial arbitration uh, options which are uh quite effective and are quite um, uh, uh and can, and are quite um, adoptable if i may say so for for investors to have in their investment contracts yeah therefore mr sansi you believe that there are other viable viable alternatives as well oh yes and absolutely and, absolutely and, and it's extremely uh, interesting that you voice this view because as we speak there has again been a very large movement uh, in terms of changing the way the dispute settlement mechanisms under investment arbitration are also uh, articulated within treaties and one solution can be found in for example the ctac where uh, the proposal has been to establish a multilateral investment court uh, and similarly another alternative is possibly recourse before the the domestic forums which is a revisitation of the calvo doctrine so to speak uh, the indian model bilateral investment treaty provides that before an investor wants recourse to treaty arbitration it has to exhaust local remedies for a period of 5 years now some commentators have viewed this provision as being very onerous mr desai do you believe this to be an onerous condition and in in your opinion do you think the domestic forums in india and indian courts are fit to adjudicate and find solutions to an investors problems yeah i think <laughs> it's a very interesting provision and uh, you know the pendulum has shifted right i think uh, pre 2015 the way the investment treaties were negotiated it was all about india being an you know capital importing country and then we got our own confidence on our own uh, you know uh, internal uh, macro level uh, strength uh, rather than the micro level issues Uh, and you know and with the white industries experience and thereafter the vodafone experience which was ongoing at that point in time obviously india took a very different stand now uh, going through the local available uh, dispute resolution mechanism you know came about along with many other uh, uh, different aspects which came in the model bit uh, but let's look at this in a little context i think it's not only india but world is moving away uh from the way the uh, the regime for investment treaty or bilateral investment treaty protection or the dispute resolution mechanisms were uh you know pre 2010 pre 2015 and what it is today many other countries not only india have taken even more stringent and conservative approach than what india has taken so i think rather than being very critical about india i would look at this as a trend uh, worldwide and then obviously we have taken what we thought uh, is relevant uh, and we, we we decided okay uh, why don't you at least exhaust your local remedies rather than jump on to the treaty look at it from that context now from a macro level perspective right when it comes to micro level i agree with you it's not 
an easy task to understand that when we have 30 million cases pending in 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 country or uh, to say that a foreign investor would uh, you know you know look for local remedies in fact white industries is a classic example of a bit because of pendency in local remedies right so it's a in a way it's a contradiction while we faced an investment treaty protection because of non availability of local remedies uh, now we are imposing local remedies as part of precondition to a bit uh, you know claim so i think somewhere we will have to uh, put our internal processes in place uh, we have to put as i think manish uh, uh, also referred that there are other ways to deal with this situation people don't have to jump directly on the bit uh, claims uh, if we are able to give those protections either through international commercial arbitration or through court regime or to specialize court regimes then this can be better handled and i i just take you know maybe 30 40 seconds on this uh, from that perspective see just take three examples how vodafone has been handled how kane energy arbitration has been handled or even devasantrix case is handled right uh, devasantrix case we had an international commercial award uh, that is running in parallel now we have a bit issue uh, that has been handled differently including bringing in several different amendments and taking local court uh, you know uh, defenses or methods or strategies to avoid those situation in kane energy we lost uh but we had to ultimately settle uh because of the way enforcement happened and vodafone started uh if i may use the word vindictive in uh, in a way uh, of the supreme court order uh and then we, we are at a stage where you know uh, to justify a retrospective amendment is becoming a problem right so i think our experiences on different bits uh, is very different and this is the culmination of the new model bit where we say that look uh we please first adopt the local remedies i don't see per se that is wrong i think where we go wrong is on the execution of it if we are able to actually develop a regime to address those concerns effectively efficiently and in a timely manner then why not i think the criticism is in my view is not about the aspect of going through local remedies the criticism is that that precondition makes the process futile right and if we are able to give some platform to address those concern i think it's a great uh, uh balance between rushing into a bit claim versus having a protection while you know the india brazil treaty uh, you know talks about no investment protection it's only state to state in that sense so i think rather than going that far this creates some kind of a balance in my view uh, but again this is my personal view and we'll see how it works out absolutely mr desai and if we were to just allude to for example the very celebrated bg case uh, the bit with argentina in that case had a provision that provided for you know exhaustion of local remedies for a period of 18 months and the contrary argument to that was that how can you know you reach uh, and uh, you know a solution within 18 months only so india's position has been if not 18 months let's make it 5 years because perhaps in 5 years uh, because it's more than 18 months there will be more of a likelihood for the investor to uh, to to have a solution to his problems uh, but as you said uh, that the 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 provision for exhaustion of local remedies should not be seen in isolation and it needs to be seen in light of other developments that are taking place across the world and perhaps the most obvious uh, country that comes to my mind is south africa uh, which in 2015 also terminated all of its bilateral investment treaties and provided for the investor to actually approach the local south african courts and if that did not yield to a solution then the provision was to enter into conciliation uh, with the government of south africa and therefore your views are actually very well taken that uh, the the provision for exhaustion of local remedies should not really be viewed in isolation 
Mr. Patel, there has been now a growing trend away from multilateral dispute settlement, where countries like India are entering into free trade agreements that provide for their own unique ways of dispute settlement, which are not like the traditional ISTS model. Do you find any merit in this approach? Uh, thank you, Anirudh. Uh, indeed, uh, one witnesses an increasing trend for specific free trade agreements in India. Does this mean that a deep dislike for free trade amounting to distrust of FTAs enabling foreign producers unrestricted access to domestic market is fading away? Or for example, is India saying that FTAs are non-inimical to the national interests such as economic uh, sustenance of uh, local producers and achieving self-sufficiency. What one can think is that given the conspicuous lack of support for free trade in India, Indian trade policy is expected to become narrow and restricted in scope. The trade engagement, in my view, is likely to be selective, focusing on partners with whom more trade would be furthering the specific national interest, like expanding export-oriented domestic production without facilitating imports. Um, India's withdrawal from uh, domestically much criticized RCP uh, reflects the profound influence of inward-looking mindsets on India's current and near-term trade policy, making India's trade outlook more circumspect and selectively engaging. For example, India would be interested in pursuing more beneficial, quote unquote, FTAs like the one with the Bay of Bengal, uh, you know, the Bimstek country, Bangladesh, India, Myanmar, Sri Lanka, as the largest economy in this grouping of countries, that is Bimstek, India's economy and geopolitical heft would help India in fashioning an FTA tailored to its advantage. And as we all know, import threats from most BIMSTEC members, except Thailand, are limited. Uh, Indian exports to these countries would increase further from tariff cuts in the FTA, as would Indian FDA through bilateral liberal invest, inward investment rules, enlarging the prospects of Indian business, creating value chains around this entire BIMSTEC. So having an FTA with countries around the Bay of Bengal also will help India geopolitically, principally in terms of countering, let's say, Chinese influence in this region. So what I do expect is that India will be pursuing beneficial FTAs. And therefore, when I was listening to uh, what the, the Prime Minister Johnson was saying last week, that the FTA with Britain uh, would have been concluded by sometime let's say October, November. So um, on one hand, um, though Britain itself is going to have much more inward looking, uh, you know, uh, because it's going to have FTA with, with the European Union as well. So how this dynamics will work out, uh, that will be quite interesting to see. But at least in the, in the near future, I do see that India will prefer more uh, beneficial FTAs like what we with BIMSTEC than what one would expect. Uh, you know, bigger, like uh, big multilateral uh, RCEP kind of um, treaty framework. Right, Professor Patel. Uh, so far, our debate in this panel has concentrated on procedural reform, but a very equally important movement in the way of ISDS reform has been towards certain substantive aspects of BITs. And Ms. Briarcliff, there has been a move away from the traditional bilateral investment treaties in some of the recent BITs that are being signed. And the move has been towards a new world that imposes investor obligations. Now, this is very significant because 
ISDS is traditionally viewed as a skewed way of dispute settlement, which only gives the right to an investor to invoke arbitration, but does not give the state a corresponding right. Therefore, the view to impose these investor obligations has actually been welcomed. In your opinion, do you believe that imposing investor obligations is a good way of regaining the trust of countries that do not really want ISDS? And do you think it is better than completely abjuring ISDS altogether? So this is a very interesting question. Um, I think broadly, in my view, if a state is of the view that they don't believe that um, investor state dispute, um, well, sorry, investment treaties uh, encourage investment flows and they don't want ISDS, the best position they can be, they could they they sh- they can take is just not to sign these treaties. Um, but I think that um, you know that. From, as I've sort of explained, I think that position it, it would be short-sighted, um, given that I do think that there is some um, benefit to these treaties in encouraging um, certain types of investors. As to whether um, including investor obligations is a fix for rebalancing treaties, um, I'm, uh, I'm not convinced. Um, not because um, I think there's anything wrong in having um, investor obligations. And I do think that, um, you know, it, if they were to work, um, it, would, uh, it would create some sort of balance. But the problem is at the moment, um, the treaties that I've examined, I think the investor obligations are somewhat aspirational as opposed to being effective. Um, you know, on the basis that these are treaties that are concluded between two states, um, you know, on, on what basis does those does the obligation come into effect? Um, at what stage does it come into effect? Um, I mean, we, we haven't yet seen any cases in which these obligations have been tested, but I see... Um, some real jurisdictional issues um, in in them working as things stand. Um, And I think states are probably, I mean, maybe there's a a sort of um, a public policy basis for including them. It's to emphasize to investors that they need to accord with certain standards. Um, But, you know, better to make those standards applicable to the investor through a direct contract or under um, domestic law. A way to balance the treaty is to focus on um, the substantive content of the obligations that are imposed on states. Um, and there, I think, you know, we've, we're seeing a lot of movement uh, in that direction too. We've talked a little bit about um, India's model BIT of 2016 and how the standards have been circumscribed there. And I think states are wise to consider how their standards uh, in their investment treaties are circumscribed to best reflect the intentions um, that they had when entering into the treaties. Um, I think that we're seeing a movement in investment treaty jurisprudence um, towards um, sort of deeper understanding of the way that these treaties are intended to operate and um, a more consistent application of the law generally. Um, and obviously every treaty is different, but we can see that there are similarities between them. Uh, and there is start, there is a broadly a much more consistent approach to the interpretation of treaties than there ever has been in the past. Nevertheless, um, you know, we've seen that there there is a risk when you're leaving the interpretation of these treaties up to um, an ad hoc uh, tribunal. And so um, a state focusing on um, the precise language of of the obligations that they enter into is is very important. I should say, though, there's a difference between negotiating and and agreeing carefully circumscribed investment treaty standards um, and agreeing a treaty that has no uh, real content from an investor perspective. Um, And I think that at least from from my standpoint in advising investors, any treaty that's concluded that doesn't give an investor a right to invoke um, the the state's obligations directly through international arbitration is in effect redundant. Um, you know, it, it's, it's a nice thing to have on paper, but it's not something which is going to encourage uh, or an investor or, or give, them any, um, get it, give them any comfort as to uh, 
the treatment with which they're the treatment that their investor is investments going to receive absolutely and and while that uh, while you may be you know uh, advising your investors and clients to maybe not take recourse to international arbitration uh, in cases of treaties that do not really offer uh, any meaningful alternative for dispute resolution internationally the fact also re- remains that even in a very utopic world even if we were to have the best possible bilateral investment treaty there always exists a possibility especially in non exit countries that a country may yet choose to not honor its commitments uh, in arbitration and therefore an investor despite having the best possible treaty may still face obstacles during the phase of enforcement and that is something mr desai highlighted uh, during the course of this discussion when he was talking about the cane arbitration uh, and the cane arbitration is actually very interesting because in the face of uh, an award that was favorable uh, to the investor india still chose not to honor uh, the award and the investor did face a lot of trouble in recognizing these rights so much so that they had to go to courts all across the world including the us including france and in the french courts uh, there was an order of attachment of uh, the properties of the government of india for 23 million dollars therefore the point is that even after successfully emerging as a victor in investment arbitration uh, an investor may still have problems mr sansi according to you how important is it to have a continuous investment policy in preserving investor confidence and i ask this question because the normal refrain that the government takes in not honoring these awards is that these obligations were not really assumed by their government they were actually assumed by a prior government and they are being saddled by these new obligations that were assumed by a prior government and that is normally the justification for not honoring these uh, commitments and i would like to know in your opinion how important would a continuity be to avoid such an eventuality i mean this is of utmost importance uh, anirudh uh, to have continuity of <coughs> of the of laws continuity of tax regime continuity of regulatory regime you know what from an investor from an investor's perspective it really does just doesn't matter whether a, a particular regime or a a type of regime existed when there was a different dispensation uh, and now at, at a different point in time there is a different dis- dispensation i mean that's very unfortunate for any state to say that uh, a particular set of laws were existing in the in the prior dispensation and now since the dispensation has changed things ought to change to the disadvantage of the, an investor who is already been who is already invested so continuity uh, of regulatory regime continuity of tax regime is of us more utmost importance i would uh, say uh, uh, anirudh and, and 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 i mean even if to ensure that continuity there are some short term losses for the for a state but in the longer term to attract more investment better quality of investment and investment both in terms of funds as well as in form of ipr stroke technology it is important that there is an absolute continuity of uh, and predictability if i may call it that ways uh, of 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 the regime uh, in terms of laws and uh, and regulatory environment Okay. Yeah, over to you. Uh, thank, thank you, Mr. Sansi. It appears Hello. we. we, Hello. we over to you. Can you hear me? Uh, we, we, I believe we lost you towards the end. And if you could just recap, maybe something you had just said, it will be really good for all of us. So I, I mean, I will, I will summarize. Sorry for this bad connect. Actually, I'm, I'm, I'm not in a place where the Wi-Fi is extremely good. uh but then uh, but i'll just repeat and summarize you know what uh, i mean it, this is a question uh, which has a very simple answer right from an investor's confidence perspective and from the perspective of protection of investors interest in a state in a jurisdiction continuity and predictability and stability of laws is extremely important right uh, 
it just doesn't matter for an investor or a set of investors that there was a separate set of laws or set of separate approach towards towards an, a, a matter when there was a different dispensation in power in a particular state and now there is a different dispensation that continuity has to be there yes laws will continue to evolve laws will continue to change but then there has to be pre predictability of of the changes and they cannot be an arbitrariness if i may call it that way in terms of the changes that may be brought in in law so continuity is of utmost importance if that was your question while while continuity is extremely important we have states like india and brazil uh, and south africa that i mentioned specifically that also want to provide for an equilibrium between the continuity of laws and their own ability to regulate what is happening in their country and therefore because of that we have seen a move away from traditional dispute settlement mechanisms uh, specifically with india and brazil now india and brazil signed a bilateral investment treaty in 2020 that provided for the investment facilitation way of dispute resolution in the beginning of the discussion i had quoted a passage from one of the investment negotiators from brazil who believed that there was no real merit in traditional dispute settlement because it did not really concentrate on the cooperative aspects of it uh the india brazil model bit as i said offers a very novel way of resolving disputes and it provides for joint committees that may be formed between uh, these two governments who may then collaboratively and in a collegiate manner come to dispute resolution to to resolve the dispute now in the event that dispute is not really resolved then the only recourse is state to state arbitration and in this sense the investor is completely eliminated from the process mr desai do you believe there is any inherent advantage of eliminating an investor from the process of dispute settlement particularly because the whole concept of the modern isds approach was to do away with diplomatic protection sure no i think it's like uh, again uh, we are talking about investment protection and we are eliminating investor from the uh, whole game right uh, obviously uh, innovation in every aspect of life uh, whether it is business or political is going to be uh you know the the order of the day and i think if i may call it this is uh while we talk about many technology disruptions i think this is the biggest disruption in the bit world uh which is you know going to have a lot of debates going forward but i think what countries forget right that this kind of uh mechanisms are not only when uh you are talking about uh investor going against uh, you know yourself it can be the other way round as well uh like many indian companies are going abroad and there are instances in the past where indian investors have used bits to protect their investments outside india right so i think somewhere you can't only look at this only from an inflow perspective you also have to look at it from an outflow perspective and how are you going to protect your own corporates uh, when they go and invest outside so in my view this cannot be uh, just a one way of looking at it you will have to see it from country to country and you will have to see from uh, you know how how you balance it uh, when you are looking for investment both ways right that is one aspect of it second uh, it is one aspect uh, that look you are eliminating investor from the whole you know game uh, and it is state to state arbitration but what if investor doesn't have a good you know repo with their home state governments how will that work out what if investor doesn't have the right uh, channel of communication with the home state and you know uh, there may be several other reasons why the home state would act in a particular manner in a situation rather than worry about a particular investment from a particular investor 
uh, in the other state where they have to run a state to state arbitration i think it throws up more complications than what it is needed for uh, the protection uh, or the promotion and protection of investment between two countries and i would uh, look at it little more skeptical uh, in in this sense because uh, this definitely does not give the sense of confidence a investor would want uh, while entering into a new jurisdiction because it it brings in a completely different aspect of state to state uh, discourse i can understand uh, there can be several preconditions to invoking an arbitration whether it is exhaustion of local remedies whether it is committees between two states we can look at look at how this can be effective and efficient uh, before the investor has a particular recourse either in a commercial arbitration or otherwise in an investment treaty arbitration uh, we can look at different models but to eliminate uh, something which provides some degree of protection to the risk uh, to the business uh, see at the end of the day any business decision can be made based on analysis on risk but how do you analyze how do you take a decision on uncertainty where it is not under your control uh, i think businesses uh, you know hate uncertainty they don't hate risks so long as you tell us okay this is the risk they can take a decision on that risk but if you tell them there is a complete uncertainty how state to state arbitration would work uh, you know it becomes very difficult to take a decision on those aspects so i would view this uh, this development uh, you know little more uh, i would say on a on a skeptic kind of a view uh, rather than uh, of course i i'm not totally negative on it but I, i i don't think this is something which can sustain in a long run that's how i look at it therefore at the end of the day the debate essentially boils down to whether india now as it is embarking on its journey as a capital exporting state whether indian investors will also be likely to avail the same protections that their government may deny the other foreign investor and therefore there has to be a balance and the government will have to take a call as to whether they will benefit by completely eliminating an investor from the process against the risk of incurring multi billion dollar awards or whether they ought to give the same opportunity to their own investors in the current system to go and resolve their disputes under a mechanism that does not seem to on the face of it uh, provide any impediment and your point to a large extent has been that this politicizes the process as well because if an investor does not enjoy confidence in the government then he does not get a forum to voice his concerns and at the end of the day it is the government only uh, that suffers because that investment is never protected now india has not been a party to the icsid convention and a related issue that comes up uh in the case of protecting foreign investors is the enforcement of investment arbitral awards in india under the new york convention miss briarcliff there has been a cleavage of opinion between two different schools of thought in india one which believes that investment awards may be enforced and one that believes that they cannot be enforced are there any arguments for an investor from a non exit state to enforce an arbitral award outside the exit convention are there any inherent advantages to this approach and what are the benefits for a state to sign on to the exit convention thanks anirudh yes so my understanding and i'm not obviously not an indian lawyer um but my understanding is the issue um that arises in relation to the enforcement of investment treaty awards in india stems from india's reservation to the new york convention um that the convention uh, only applies uh, to differences arising out of legal relationships that are considered 
commercial yes. under national law. Um, and, and there have been different approaches um, by the uh, Delhi High Court and the Kolkata High Court on that. And now as to whether or not there are um, there are arguments for construing um, the position in favour of the enforcement of investment treaty arbitration awards under Indian law, um, I, I can't answer. But from a public policy perspective and thinking about um, third states, as you as you mentioned, um, yes, there is uh, an argument in favour of um, that construction, or indeed, um, you know, I India clarifying its position to make uh, investment treaty awards enforceable, because um, there's very little benefit to having, um, well, from an investor perspective, um, the possibility of recourse against a state. Um, if an award can't ultimately enfor be enforced against that state. And, and now it might be possible to enforce an award in a third state where a state has, where, where the host state has assets. But in, in most instances, um, the majority of a state's assets will be um, in its own jurisdiction. And so an investor will want to be assured that they're able to enforce an award um, domestically. Um, now, of course, everyone hopes that a state will, always, will, will comply with an award voluntarily, but it, it doesn't always happen. Um, and I think from, you know, from India's perspective or any other state um, in India's position, um, you know, the benefit of having enforcement under the New York Convention is, of course, that there is some degree of a national court review of awards before they're enforced under the New York Convention. There are limited bases on which a national court can find that an award is not enforceable, for example, if it contravenes public policy, um, or if there is an issue with, um, there was an issue with the tribunal's ju jurisdiction. And they're very limited grounds, but they do exist. Um, I think, you know, so they're, they're um, you know, by, allowing awards to be enforceable, investment treaty awards to be enforceable, um, you create investor confidence. And then on the other hand, the, the New York Convention offers um, that sort of domestic oversight uh, to some degree. Um, the ICSID Convention, of course, doesn't offer that or shouldn't offer that technically, since uh, under the ICSID Convention, um, ICSID awards are to be enforced in ICSID Convention states as if they were a domestic judgment of that state um, so there aren't those kind of um, grounds for review that exist under um, under the New York Convention however um, the ICSID Convention is really seen as the hallmark of um, uh, for investors of you know that gets of, a, of an instrument which gives them confidence um, in an investment treaty system and certainly um, in almost every instance where I've advised an investor if exit arbitration is available and the relevant state is a party to that convention, the, the investor will pursue exit arbitration for that very reason. Um, and it's not that there is no possible uh, recourse against an award at all within the exit system. That, that's not right. There is. Uh, it's possible to seek annulment of an exit award within the exit system for very limited grounds. Um, you know, it, so if there's a real problem with the award, it, it can be addressed, um, but it's addressed in that supranational structure that ICSID is, uh, rather than uh, than before national courts. So, you know, overall, ICSID it offers um, investors um, sort of greater protection, as it were, um, but perhaps the New York Convention offers uh, some balance that, that the states um, that the states hope for. I think with those remarks, we've almost also reached time. Uh, but before we part ways, I would want to yield the floor one last time to Professor Patel. Uh, as a parting remark, how do you think that the civil justice system in India can improve and ensure confidence for foreign investors? Uh, thank you very much, Anirudh. Unlike my remarks on the previous two questions where I speak of figures and facts and names of the countries. Here I'm going to be a little more academic. So if you see the last 10 years of jurisprudence and also the legislative framework uh, of India, it demonstrates clearly the critical role of justice for fostering a healthy business environment, enhancing growth, improving access to public services, Corruption and also restraining the abuse of power. 
if you look at about courts prosecutors complaint maker agencies anti corruption agencies ministries of law and justice at union as well as state level which are foundation for the social contract between people and the indian state they have been addressing breaches of law providing redress for violation of rights whether it is commercial rights they have been facilitating resolution of trade commerce and investment disputes in fact they have been effectively overseeing the state institutions and enforcing the state's role as regulator which which is not being spoken loudly about because of this the culture of accountability has increased trust in the government has been growing resulting into expanding of capital markets it would not have been possible if you look at simply the expansion of capital markets it is really phenomenal the investment of by foreign houses with confidence that their property rights are protected more interpretations more clarifications are provided all the opposite has caused certain political damage to the government in power but that has enabled a strong confidence culture uh let me give you tangible empirical evidence government has created mechanisms which are responding to citizen claims and grievances i'm talking in the area of let's say healthcare there are certainly challenges but the results are there for us to see again thanks to the three organs of the state they're facilitating the litigation of tax cases thereby helping tackle tax evasion and corruption the results are there for us to see the government focus on community based mechanisms to resolve community conflicts are yet another sign that justice institutions are working let's look at extracting industry we talk about the white industry case among others as well uh the compliances are taking by the actors the arbitration councils and institutions are being promoted the results of these institutions will be seen in 10 years time look at the financial intelligence unit and enforcement directorate money laundering being fought no before the government focus on administrative laws and delivery of services yet another strong achievement that our civil justice system and of course criminal justice system as well are responding preventing and able to create faith fear and respect i'm not saying that there are no challenges that may occur but these are the long the measures which are increasing foreign investors confidence i can tell you from an example of law commission and i can say that some of the reforms which we proposed as a member of as a law commission these reports were adopted and they are worked by the supreme court as well as the government in fact i was personally involved to a great extent and we removed as many as uh, 1600 acts you know out of nearly 7000 acts now if you, if you see the impact of those removal of this archaic laws among others which would have a direct impact on what you are talking today trade inducement will be felt in years to come so what i'm saying is that the legislative reforms and proactive civil justice system are growing hand in hand and despite uh, simmering tension between executive and judiciary at times and of course uh, the the law firms and the lawyers uh, they would have different opinion i think we have been able to demonstrate and ensure greater confidence and as uh, various world institutions uh, they are saying that india does remain um, a bright spot and uh, uh, india is keeping in mind the twin goal of increasing on one hand investors confidence and at the same time protecting and promoting national interest including security and i think this is the um, balance uh, game of balance which india will keep doing but overall if you see uh, there is a huge reforms uh, subtle reforms as well and five years down the road you definitely see much more uh, investor confidence uh, both at g2g level as well as b2b level thank you very much professor patel i think we have uh, two audience questions here uh, which uh, we would also want to ask and i believe we have some time for that the first question is uh, directed to miss briarcliff uh, and the question is that 
one may think that india's experience as a respondent state in investment arbitration has pushed the state into a rather protectionist cocoon what are the possibilities of india setting up specialist courts to solve international investment disputes um i mean that's a, it's it's a it's a question for the indian government um related to its own sort of uh, capacity and interest but you know that's certainly an option which is being looked at very closely by other governments around the world um in particular um states in the european union are very clearly pushing for um the establishment of an investment court as being a solution to um or an advance on this investor state dispute resolution before, before ad hoc tribunals um and of course at the moment there are very uh detailed discussions ongoing before unsa trial working group 3 um in which um i believe india is participating um discussing whether or not there should be um universal agreement on the establishment of some sort of permanent institution to address investment treaty um arbitration now we probably don't have time to discuss all of the pros and cons of uh that option um you know if it were to lend a uh, greater confidence from both the investor and state side in the investment treaty system then i can see arguments for it um but from a practical perspective you know whether it really moves the dial and makes a difference i'm I, i'm not convinced um you know i think that there are um some serious cons from a kind of efficiency and cost perspective um but you know i mean i i don't really think that the the reason this alternative is being proposed is actually to sort of to make to re- to improve the system from a kind of procedural perspective i think it's more about um uh restoring confidence in, in the structure overall thank you and our second question is addressed to mr desai and the question is india has terminated 68 bilateral investment treaties recently and is negotiating new ones based on the 2015 model bit how do you think that is impacting investment in india yeah i think we covered that a little bit uh, during our discussion uh, in some form but as i said this is not an india phenomena right i think as naomi also talked about europe moving out of uh an arbitration regime to a court uh you know a dispute resolution mechanism and there also newer provisions are coming in in terms of uh what kind of state to state protections will be granted in those uh you know uh, agreements including i think you and others also refer to uh the south african uh you know model and then the brazilian model so i think uh this question is you know very interesting because one would never know what uh the the world would be without this kind of a stringent bit right because we'll never experience that world uh and uh you know we'll only deal with the situation which we are in today but my short answer is uh definitely it it is one of the criteria for an investor to uh decide on the jurisdiction they want to go into uh maybe there are other criterias where india will trump other jurisdiction and therefore investor will still come but if you have a apple to apple comparison and without a proper investment treaty uh, regime or promotion and protection regime uh then definitely india will lose out on such a stand uh, being taken uh so far as the promotion and protection of any investment is concerned thank you very much and i believe that brings us to the end of today's discussion which i found to be extremely fruitful insightful and thought provocative uh, especially on a weekend uh, i would like to thank all of our panelists today who took out time from their very very busy schedules and uh, addressed certain very important aspects uh that have been plaguing the isds system uh we there were some agreements there were some disagreements but i'm glad that there were more agreements than disagreements and i think that is the biggest takeaway from today's uh discussion 
uh, i would like to thank everyone for their candor and i hope you found this equally informative just like i did i hope your saturday was as good as mine was <laughs> and uh, thank you so much for being here thank you so much for uh, you know having such uh, an analytical discussion on certain very very burning issues sure thank you thanks a lot thank you everyone thank you very much namaskar